A good number of you think I only focus on internal medicine and pediatrics on the channel, but I'm here to tell you that this channel is meant for all medical related issues and medical related courses. So with that said in mind, welcome to the Bazooka season one finale for surgery. We never had a finale for surgery season one. We only had finales for internal medicine as well as pediatrics. This is a show on my YouTube channel where we'll look at 10 OSCE stations in one clinical course. But in this case, because it's a season finale for surgery, we're going to be looking at 20 OSCE stations. Take note that there may be some graphical images in this presentation that are only intended for teaching purposes. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu and welcome to the Bazooka. If you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe to the channel, drop a like, drop a comment, and share the page as we reach 100 people at the end of this month. And possibly at the end of the year, we can reach our target, which is 1,000 subscribers. So grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Beginning with our station one, the picture shows a breast of a lactating mother. What is the most likely diagnosis? What will be the symptoms? What will be the signs with reference to the diagnosis in one and give two differential diagnoses. So I shall give you some time to think through this question. So I shall give you two seconds as usual. You may pause the video if you like. And here comes the answer. So most likely this is lactational mastitis and it's going to present to you with throbbing breast pain which is also referred to as nostalgia, which obviously will be non-cyclical and will be associated with breastfeeding or during that time of breastfeeding. There may be some breast swelling, there may be some breast redness, there may be fever, sometimes even a prevalent breast discharge. And what will be the signs with reference to the diagnosis in one? There will be breast tenderness when you palpate, there will be pearl d'orange. This is just a, a French word to mean the peel of an orange. So how an orange peel actually looks like, that's how the breast will have that consistency as you can see in this picture here. There may also be breast tenderness. I think this is repeated twice. This was meant to be breast erythema, so it may be red. Then give two differential diagnosis. There may be inflammatory breast cancer. It may be breast abscess. You may even have a galactosil. Station two, the slide shows intraoperative findings of a patient presenting with small bowel obstruction. Part A, describe what you see in the picture. Part B, what is the diagnosis? Part C, what will be the symptoms? Part D, what will be the abdominal findings on the examination? Part E, what diagnostic investigations would you order? So that's the image shown on the picture. I will give you two seconds. And here comes the answer. So as we can see here, we have invagination of the bowel or telescoping of the bowel within itself. You refer to this as intussusception. It is very common in children. So it's going to present to you with this intermittent, moderate, sometimes even severe abdominal pain, not because the intussusception has resolved, but rather you have the bowel segment that has transiently stopped contracting. So the, the pain going away may not necessarily mean that this, this patient is no longer at risk of them still having the intussusception. It may still be there. There may be some abdominal bloating. There may be some distension that may be there. There may be vomiting. There may be constipation. And sometimes there may be blood in stool. So it may, you may actually confuse this for typhoid. So you get a late sign, which is known as a red current jelly, which is stool mixed with blood and mucus. Now you understand why you may confuse it for typhoid. You may also get features of dehydration and lethargy. When you examine on inspection, there will obviously be some abdominal distension. There may be some tenderness on palpation, guarding, and what you may feel is a sausage-shaped mass on the abdominal palpation. On auscultation, the bowel sounds may or may not be present. When you do a digital rectal examination, you may not find any stool in the rectum, so it may be empty, and in children, you may actually palpate the intussusceptum. Then what, which is the diagnostic investigations you order? You'd order for a plain x-ray, which would be supine and an erect. You may see multiple air fluid levels. You may order a barium enema where you're going to be seeing a claw sign or a coiled spring sign, or which is known as a pincer ends. You do an ultrasound. You may see a target sign or pseudo kidney sign, or it's also referred to as a bull's eye sign. Then of course you do a Doppler where you may see a mass with a donut sign. This is obviously to check the blood supply to the bowel. Then how would you manage or treat this child? So initial management involves resuscitation. So your ABCs and in your exams, please do not write ABCs. 
write exactly what you're going to be doing. Check in that the airway is patent, check in that the patient is breathing, administering oxygen, gain is, gaining venous axis. You're going to push in an NG tube. You also catheterize this patient and put an IV line, which we've already talked about in the ABCs. Start running your fluids, monitor the urinary output that is there, start the monitor venous broad spectrum antibiotics, as well as the definitive management is surgical management, laparotomy, where they can actually milk out the segments and check if the bowel is viable. If it isn't, then you may need to resect. Station three, what examination is shown in this? Is this slide showing? What is the examiner trying to demonstrate? What is the most likely nature of the lump? So I'll give you two seconds to think through this. And here is the answer. So this is a positive transillumination test. Most likely this is a ganglion cyst. So the examiner is actually trying to confirm whether the growth is actually going to be containing fluid, semi-solid, or it's going to be having solid components. So this is going to be helping determine the nature of the lump. And most likely, and most likely the nature of the lump is going to be a, a soft and a cystic um, material so obviously it's going to be a ganglion cyst then what is the diagnosis what are the different types of this condition name at least two complications i have blurred out part of this image because of the youtube guidelines that are present according to the community so bear with me so i'll give you two seconds to think through this and give me the answer Okay, so here's the answer. So most likely this is an indirect inguinal hernia. And what are the types? So you have an incomplete hernia, you can sometimes have a complete hernia. So an incomplete hernia is, um, you can refer to it as a bubonosil, or it can be a funicular type, or you could have a pantalon or saddle bag. Then a complete hernia is referred to as an inguinoscrotal hernia. Then two complications would be strangulation, they could be infarction, they could be gangrene, they could be peritonitis, even bowel obstruction. And remember how we differentiate between inguinal, direct inguinal hernias and indirect inguinal hernias. Remember that the direct inguinal hernia is going to be protruding through the Hasselbeck's triangle. And remember that this Hasselbeck's triangle is made by the lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle. The inferiorly, it's made up by the inguinal ligament, and on the lateral aspect is made up by the inferior epigastric artery. So if the hernia is actually protruding through this Hasselbeck's triangle, you refer to that as a direct inguinal hernia. If the hernia is protruding medial um, to the um, inferior epigastric artery and passing into this triangle, you refer to it as direct hernia. If it's passing lateral to this uh, inferior epigastric artery and through the deep inguinal ring, then you refer to that as an indirect hernia. Station five, the examination shows an endoscopic, oh, the picture shows an endoscopic examination of the stomach. What is the diagnosis? Most, what is, what are the most likely symptoms? Give the name of the endoscopic examination done in the patient. Which other investigation may be done to confirm the diagnosis? What are the possible complications or list possible complications? So I shall give you two seconds to think through it. Okay, so most likely this is a this is peptic ulcer disease or a gastric ulcer. So it may present to you with the epigastric pain worsened by eating and you get this burning and um, this burning feeling in the epigastric region. There may be some bloating that may be there. There may be some hematemesis, which is vomiting out blood. You may sometimes have this dark discoloration of the stool because of the upper GI bleeding, which you refer to as melina. You may have anorexia that may be there. You may have nausea. You may have vomiting. And the name of this endoscopic examination is referred to as a gastroscopy. You may do a biopsy together with the same gastroscopy. So what other investigations would you do to confirm the diagnosis? Of course, a biopsy. You may also order for H. pylori stool antigen test because it may be caused by H. pylori. So what are the possible complications? You could have hemorrhage. You could have anemia because of the chronic bleeding. You could have penetration to the other organs such as the pancreas. Uh, you could have perforation, which may lead to peritonitis. You may have gastric outlet obstruction if it's very near to the pylorus and uh, in the enteral region of the stomach. You may have pyloric stenosis. You may have this ulcer becoming malignant. So there may be some malignant transformation. You may also 
transform this into a gastric carcinoma or it puts the patient at risk of developing a gastric carcinoma. Station 6. The picture shows the x-ray of an RTA victim. Describe what you see. What would be the local findings on examination? How would you treat the condition? So I'll give you two seconds to actually think through this question. And I will be releasing videos on x-rays very soon. Watch out for those on the channel. And if you haven't yet subscribed, you're going to miss out on those videos. So please hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell notification icon too to be receiving notifications every time I post such videos so that you don't get to miss out. So let's go to the answer. So this is an, a complete oblique fracture of the distal fibula. As we can see over here, this is completely fractured. It's even slightly displaced. And also a fracture of the tibia, the medial malleolus of the tibia. There is also some soft tissue swelling. So when you examine this patient on inspection, there's obviously going to be swelling of the limb. There may be some erythema that may be there. There may be some tenderness on palpation. There may be an obvious deformity that you may see. And there may be some crepitus when you move the bones. I, I Please do not move the bones to just elicit this crepitus because the patient will be in so much pain. Then how we treat this patient, we want to resuscitate this patient. So gain venous access, um, ensure that the patient is breathing, give oxygen, ensure that the airway is patent. And if there's any obvious bleeding, compress the bleeding until the bleeding stops. If there are, there are features of them becoming hypotensive despite you them having any visible bleeds they could be bleeding internally okay so you should resuscitate this patient start running your fluids and then if they have any open wounds then ensure that you give them tetanus prophylaxis then also give them analgesia cover them on broad spectrum antibiotics if there are open wounds that are present third generation cephalosporins are very good then the fracture treatment is obviously going to be irrigation and debridement of any wounds that may be present and then you reduce the fracture with internal fixation so you perform open reduction and internal fixation where you may even actually use intramedullary nailing or you can plate the bone and then of course rehabilitation of the patient station seven the picture shows a client donating blood give at least three contraindications for donating blood give two indications for blood transfusion mention five complications associated with blood donation i will give you two seconds to think through this question and I encourage most of you also to donate some blood towards the blood bank to save a patient's life. And we will greatly appreciate when you do such a gesture. So three contraindications. So if the patient has anemia, don't donate blood. We do not allow them to donate blood because they already do not have any extra blood to give. It's kind of like you're broke and you want to give away your last money and when you need it more than the other person needs it. So we do not, it's contraindicated to, trans, to donate blood when you're anemic. If you have any heart conditions like heart failure, if you have any infections like HIV, if you have any malignancies such as leukemias, lymphomas, or plasma cell disorders, we, you're not allowed to donate blood. Then give two indications for blood transfusion. So acute hemorrhage, you could have things like refractory or symptomatic anemias. You could have patients that are on renal dialysis because remember that the kidneys are responsible for production of erythropoietin. And if erythropoietin isn't produced, then you may not be producing the same number of red blood cells. This patient may have anemia. Then thrombocytopenia, as well as some other platelet disorders, we also use blood transfusions in the management of certain conditions such as disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is DIC, hemorrhagic shock, burns, even bleeding disorders. Then we can also transfuse blood perioperatively or even post-operatively. Then mention five complications associated with blood donation. So these may be acute complications, which include things like intravascular hemolysis due to ABO incompatibility. There may be extravascular hemolysis, which may be due to RHO, non-ABO antigen incompatibility. There may be some non-hemolytic febrile reactions. You may go into anaphylactic shock. There may be congestive cardiac failure with fluid overload. There may be some infections, but usually we check for Oh, we screen for most of these infections, so it's very rare now. But way back, people used to get hepatitis, especially hepatitis C. You could also get infections like HIV, CMV, EBV, bacteria infections such as syphilis, even parasitic infections such as Trypanosoma cruzi, which causes sleeping sickness. You may also get malaria. Then you may have 
other complications such as air embolism, thrombophobitis, hemochromatosis, and iron overload, you may get citrate into intoxication, which may present as bradycardia and hypocalcemia with also recurrent or repetitive or excessive blood transfusions. Then you may also get transfusion-related acute lung injury as well as graft versus host disease in the long run. So station eight, what is the specimen? What is the most likely diagnosis? What will be the clinical presentation of the above diagnosis? So that's the specimen that has been isolated in the theater. I will give you two seconds to think through it and give me your answer. So here comes the answer. So this is obviously a vermiform appendix. So vermiform meaning it looks like a worm, then this is most likely append, append, appendicitis, so they are performing an appendectomy, so or appendicectomy rather. And what will be the clinical presentation of the above diagnosis? So they may have certain characteristic symptoms. So obviously the pain is going to start off in the umbilicus because it's visceral type of pain, and then it's going to migrate to the right iliac fossa and become a somatic type of pain. The patient may have abdominal pain when coughing, they may have nausea and vomiting. They may have anorexia. They may have constipation or diarrhea, depending on the type of appendix that they have. So they may, if it's a post ilio or pelvic appendix, you may present with constipation or diarrhea. Then you may have a fever, which is low grade. You may have tachycardia as well as urinary frequency. Then the signs that you may see, there are different signs that you will elicit on this patient. So there may be some tachycardia that may be there. You may have tenderness as well as rebound tenderness in the right iliac fossa. You refer to that as Bloomberg's sign. You may have pain at the McBurney's point. Remember that the McBurney's point is a point. If you were to draw a line and imagine a line from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine, if you go two thirds away from the umbilicus and a third um, uh, away from the anterior superior iliac spine, you refer to that point as the McBurney's point. So if they point in that area as the area of maximum tenderness, then you call that as the pointing sign. You also have Rofsen's sign, which is pressing on the left iliac fossa will uh, cause uh, pain in the right iliac fossa because of the shifting of the bowel and irritation of the peritoneum. You may also have psoas test, which is positive in retrocecal appendicitis, where hyperextension of the hip causes pain in the right iliac fossa. You may have obturated test, which is seen in pelvic appendicitis, where internal rotation of the hip is going to be causing pain in the right iliac fossa due to irritation of the obturator internus muscle. Then you may also have Baldwin sign, which is positive in retrocecal appendicitis. When the leg is lifted off the bed with the knee extended, the patient is obviously going uh, to be complaining of pain when pressing on the abdomen, so the ribs and the ilium ilial region. Then based on the Montreal score or the Alvarado score, you usually give a score to this patient. So if they have migrating pain to the right iliac fossa, you give them a score of one. If they have anorexia, you give them a score of one. If they have nausea and vomiting, you give them a score of one. If they have tenderness, you give them a score of two. Rebound tenderness, you give them a score of one. Elevation in the temperature, you give them a score of one. Uh, lymphocytosis, you give them a score of one and then shift towards the um, neutrophils, you give them a score of one. So you add all this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think the other one should be two. So you add all these scores. Leukocytosis, I think, should be two, if I'm not mistaken. You add all this, please correct me in the comment section below if I am wrong. So you add all these and then you summit them. If the score is below five, then you're not sure that this could be appendicitis. If it's five to six, then it's compatible with appendicitis. If it's six to nine, it's probably appendicitis. And then if it's nine to 10, then it is definitely. So it's confirmed appendicitis. So station nine, a patient presents with high fever with a swollen, painful right leg for one week. What is the most likely diagnosis? Which investigations would you do? What is the differential diagnosis? What are the most likely complications? What treatment would you recommend? So I'll give you two seconds to think through this. And here comes the answer. So most likely this is cellulitis. So you want to do some blood cultures. You also do an x-ray. You may also do a Doppler ultrasound. You may do a full blood count or a differential with a differential count. EC, ESR, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate, C-reactive protein, 
as well as D-dimers because this could be a DVT or a deep vein thrombosis. Then, of course, you your differentials would be acute osteomyelitis as well as deep vein thrombosis. And the most likely complication could be ischemia. There could be gangrene. There may be chronic venous insufficiency. The treatment, of course, would be limb elevation, intravenous antibiotics, as well as analgesia. Station 10, identify the following suture techniques, classify different types of suture materials, and give examples. So here are the suture techniques. Over here, one, two, three. Where is three? One, two two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So identify the suture, suture techniques. And here comes the answer. So number one here, this is known as a simple continuous suture where you enter in once and you keep making these zigzags within the tissue. So this is known as a simple continuous suture. Number two here is referred to as a simple interrupted suture where you make one loop here, you tie the knot and cut it off. Make another loop, you tie the knot and cut it off. You can actually use the rule of 50s. So if you get a wound that say you suture here halfway, then you divide it into two. Then you suture halfway there, then you suture halfway there. Then you suture half, half. So you suture in halves. So that's um, the simple interrupted suture. Then number three here is known as... Um, what we're going to be referring to as an interrupted mattress suture, where I like to call this as the far, far, near, near. So you you enter into the wound at a distance that's far away, then you come out on the other side far away, then you enter at a closer distance to the wound, and then you come out at a closer distance to the wound, then you tie the knot off and cut it off. That's referred to as an interrupted mattress suture. And then number four here is a, a subcutaneous or a continuous subcutical suture where you enter into the subcutaneous region and the suture is actually buried underneath the tissues. Then number five here is uh, obviously a horizontal uh, mattress suture. Number six here is a vertical mattress suture. Then number seven over here where you make your crisscrosses. This is known as a cruciate suture. Then number eight is a forward interlocking suture, or you can call it as a continuous interlocking sutures where they interlock over there. Then the last one here will be a continuous horizontal mattress suture. So the different types of suture materials, you could have absorbable sutures, which can be synthetic, such as monocryl and vicryl, as well as PDS. You could also have natural um, absorbable sutures, which are made of collagen. You have non-absorbable sutures, which can be synthetic, such as proline and ethylon. You could also have natural sutures, such as silk, surgical steel, as well as surgical cotton. And then there were other questions that I actually didn't add on the question sec section. So state the best suture material for different body tissues. So for the absorbable sutures, these are going to be used in deep tissues such as small bowel anastomosis, suturing urinary or biliary tract, uh, tying off small blood vessels near the skin. You could use non-absorbable sutures for slow healing tissues such as tendons, fascia, even closure of the abdominal wall, even in vascular anastomosis. Then... List the complications of suturing, which are shown on the next page. So early, it could be hematoma. You could have some reactions to the suture. You could have compartment syndrome if you tie the sutures too tight. You could have nerve and vessel entrapment. You could have unknotting of the sutures. Intermediate complications include infections. And then late complications, obviously, keloids and hypertrophic scars, which are due to the wounds themselves. Then station 11 apologies for giving you the answer how many mils are present in one unit of blood so about 450 mils then how would you manage an acute hemolytic reaction so you'd stop the transfusion immediately across check the blood that's given so obtain fresh samples and send the samples back to the lab do your abcs Start hydrating the patient with normal saline you can give frusamide about 20 to 40 milligrams you can also give high adrenaline 0 0.5 to 1 milligram you can give hydrocortisone or antihistamines as a slow IV infusion catheterize the patient if they are not and monitor the urine output if there are features of hyperkalemia you may treat the hyperkalemia by giving 50 mils of 50 percent dextrose plus 10 international units of insulin then of course monitor the vitals and the labs I don't know how the question came before the answer. So station 12, describe what is seen in the picture above. What is the diagnosis? Where is the anatomical, what is the location of the fluid and anatomical defect? What are the clinical features? What is the definitive management? So I will give you 
two seconds to think through this question. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously tapping or aspiration of fluid from a hydrocele, and the diagnosis obviously will be a hydrocele. So where is the location of the fluid and anatomical defect? So this between the tunica vaginalis and tunica albuginea of the testes along the sperm, or it could be along the spermatic cord. Then the anatomical defect is, of course, a, a patent processus vaginalis. What are the clinical features? You get a smooth scrotal swelling, usually in the anterior inferior to the testes, and you can't go above it. Then what is the definitive diagnosis? You do what is known as hydroselectomy. You may do a Lodes procedure where you placate the tunica vaginalis, or you may invert the sac, which is known as a Jabolais repair. And the definitive treatment is indicated if the patient is symptomatic or the hydrocele doesn't resolve by the age of one or two. So they are much more common in children. Here's an alternative image of a hydrocele. As we can see, it's also showing a positive transillumination test. Station 13, give the term or terms used to describe the name given to a hernia with the following contents, a portion of circumference of bowel, urinary bladder, vermiform appendix, Meckel's diverticulum, intestine, and omentum. I will give you four seconds to think through this question. If you are liking these videos, please drop a like and drop a comment. And here comes the answer. So a portion of circumference of bowel is referred to as a Richter's hernia. If you have urinary bladder, you refer to that as a cystocele. If you have a vermiform appendix, you refer to that as an Amyandi's hernia. If you have Merkel's diverticulum, you refer to that as Litter's hernia. If you have intestines that are present there, you refer to that as an enterocele. If you have omentum, you refer to that as an omentocele or an epiploicele. Then station 14, describe the findings of the x-ray above. What is your diagnosis? What are the clinical features? What is the treatment? Again, I will release a video on x-rays very soon. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And here comes the answer. So as we can see here, the humerus is displaced medially and inferiorly to the scapula. Then you have the humeroid head and the outline of the glenoid uh, cavity are not congruent. So they are incongruent. So this is obviously an anterior shoulder dislocation. And the clinical features on the history, you may get a history of a blow to an abducted or an elbow extended as well as externally rotated arm. Like for example, if someone falls on an outstretched arm, then when you examine the patient, you'll see the obvious joint deformity. The joint cavity may not be palpable on that side. The arm will be externally rotated and the shoulder also will be externally rotated and there will be some numbness of the arm. There may be some resistance to all movements. And of course, the treatment is reduction under sedation and analgesia and then put the patient in an arm sling. Station 15 is another x-ray. Describe the findings in the x-ray. What is the diagnosis? What are the clinical features? What is the treatment? So I'll give you two seconds to think through this. And here comes the answer. So the humor head and the outline of glenoid cavity are incongruent, just like the other x-ray. As we can see, the head of the humerus appears to be rotated, and it's going to give us this appearance, which is referred to as a light bulb appearance or an ice cream cone appearance. So this is seen with posterior shoulder dislocations. Then what are the clinical features? So you get history of a blow to the anterior, anterior aspect of the shoulder or... You get these extreme muscle contractions, such as with seizures. When you examine this patient, of course, there will be some joint deformities. The arm and the shoulder will be rotated internally. There may be some numbness on the arm. And of course, you have some resistance to movement of the arm. Treatment, just like with anterior shoulder dislocations, it's of course reduction uh, under sedation and analgesia and put this patient in an arm sling. Station 16, what is your diagnosis? What findings would you expect on examination? How would you treat this condition? So take your time, look at the picture. I will give you two seconds. Pause the video if you may. Here comes the answer. So this is obviously a flail chest. A flail chest is where you get two or more ribs, subsequent ribs fractured in two different positions or more. So as you can see here, ribs four, five, and six and seven are, are fractured at two sides. So you refer to this as a flail chest. So when what will happen is that as this person breathes in, this segment here will be going inside. As they breathe out, this segment here will be going outwards 
or you have what is referred to as a paradoxical breathing, the opposite of what I just explained um, per se. So the fractured segment is pulled in uh, into the low pressure during inspiration and then pushed out uh, of the high pressure thorax during expiration. And then when you palpate, there may be some tenderness in this area of the fractures. It may be hyperresonant if there's an associated pneumothorax. Then of course, there'll be reduced air entry and chest expansion on this affected side. How we treat this? ABC, so airway, breathing, circulation, give oxygen, give this patient some analgesia. You can strap the flail segments and then you could use an ICD if there is a pneumothorax or if the lung has collapsed, then of course cover this patient on antibiotics. If they have an open wound, also give tetanus prophylaxis. Station 17, give two methods of assessing severity of burns. Which special areas of the body are considered when assessing complications of burns? Why are fluids given in the treatment of burns? I think the better question that should have been asked here is when should the fluids be given? But I will leave that to you and drop a comment in the section below to tell me when you would want to give a patient that has burns fluids. Then part D, how do you determine how much fluid should be given? So I'll give you two seconds to think through this. And here comes the answer. So you could use the London Broder charts, which are very accurate in determining the severity of burns. You could use Wallace's rule of sevens or nines, where each body part or each body segment is divided into a percentage body surface area. Or you could use the rule of palms, where we assume that the patient's palm is representing 1%. So the special areas include the face, the hands, the feet, across joints, the perineum, or any circumferential uh, full thickness burn affecting any body part, especially the extremities. Then the fluids are given, of course, to maintain the tissue perfusion in the early phase of a burn. So fluids are not meant to, or, or fluids rather are meant to correct the shock and the hypo, hypovolemia that's going to be there because you're losing water during the process of this burn. And of course, you have all this fluid that is stuck in the tissues. Then how do you determine how much fluid should be given? So we use Parkland's formula where the volume is going to be equal to 4 mils multiplied by the percentage burn surface area multiplied by the weight. Sometimes they may actually give you a picture and you may be asked to calculate the burn percentage area and then calculate the fluids and how you give the fluids. So take note of that. Station 18, describe what you see. What type of collagen is found in the tissue shown above? List two causes and how do you treat? So I'll give you two seconds to think through this and look at the picture. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously a post-burn flexion contracture affecting the right medial aspect of the thigh and the leg. So it's across the joint. Then the type of collagen is obviously type 1. Remember type 1 is found predominantly in bone. Type 2 collagen is found in cartilage. Type 3 collagen is found in blood vessels and pretty much pliable tissue. Then type four is found in the basement membrane. List two causes, so it could be with burns or even severe physical trauma. And how would you treat surgical treatment? You could incise and release the contracture. So you call that as a scar release. You could perform skin grafting or you could do a local a triangular flap technique. Station 19, describe the findings seen. What is your most likely diagnosis? How would you treat? I'll give you two seconds to think through this question. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously a smooth appearing round swelling on the lateral aspect of the eye. This is obviously the right eye. Then this is, this is consistent with the dermoid cyst. So you treat by an excision biopsy. Then the last and indeed the final station, describe what is shown in the image, list four indications and list four complications of its use. So the image is over here and what is shown in the image here. So I'll give you two seconds to think through that. And here comes the answer. I don't know why this didn't have the answer or I put the slide twice. So here's the answer. So this is an intercostal chest drainage. So four indications include things like massive pleural effusions, tension pneumothorax, empyema thoracis, where you have pus in the thoracic cavity. You could also have hemothorax, where you have blood. You could also have chylothorax, where you have lymph. Then four complications, you could have early complications or late complications. There could be tube misplacement. There could be surgical emphysema. There could be injury to organs and surrounding structures. So you could injure the heart if you go very far. You could injure the phrenic nerve. You could injure the neurovascular 
bundle, you could have a contralateral pneumothorax. Then late complications include the tube can actually be blocked. The tube can actually slip out. You could have infections along the tube. You could also have fistula formation. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this season finale on surgery, the bazooka. Stay tuned for season two. That's going to be the year of the bazooka. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Share the page, share the channel. We want to reach 1,000 subscribers before the year ends. Drop a like, drop a comment. Until next time, God bless to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Bye-bye.